Okay, let's introduce ourselves to the second major method of membrane transport, facilitate diffusion. This is where molecules are going to go from high to low concentration, which is exergonic. But the problem is, these are molecules that are too big or too polar or both to get across the membrane at a significant rate on their own. Even though the concentration difference may indeed be great, the chance of them getting across the membrane is quite slim. So in order to get these molecules across membranes in a significant amount, they need some help. And the help comes in the way of specific membrane transport proteins. Okay, these membrane transport proteins, numerous different kinds, they are highly selective. You have ion transports that will recognize sodium ions but not potassium. Others that do potassium but not sodium. Some that do magnesium but not calcium or calcium but not magnesium. Others are a little less specific. There are transport proteins that take a wide range of six carbon sugars across them. There are several different kinds of amino acid transport proteins that each taking a range of similar, structurally similar amino acids, but not others. <coughs> so there's a lot of specificity with facilitate diffusion. Now, what facilitate diffusion proteins do is this. They provide a tunnel or channel through the membrane that allows molecules that ordinarily would not want to cross the lipid bilayer on their own to get through. It's like building a tunnel under a road or something. You may not want to cross the road on your own, especially if it's really busy, but if there's a tunnel underneath it, it's easy to cross. So facilitate diffusion is going to allow Facilitate diffusion is going to allow a transport of molecules that are polar or larger than what would typically cross the membrane well on their own. Now, these facilitate diffusion proteins are proteins that span completely through the membrane. So part of them's on the outside, part of them's on the inside. Either, now there's many different kinds, we have some tertiary and quaternary structure information about some of them, far too few, but some of them it's a single protein molecule. It happens to have a polar a channel, a tunnel through the protein lined with polar amino acids. So things that are polar would not want to be in a greasy, oily lipid bilayer, have a nice polar environment that they can travel through. So you know, I have something like this. We have a single protein, and it happens to have a polar channel going through it. In other cases, you have several individual proteins joining together to form sort of a molecular donut. And the donut hole is lined with polar amino acids and allows the transport to take place. So there are some, there are some facilitate diffusion proteins where the functional channel is actually made of multiple copies of a particular protein. Others, just the single protein has a tunnel inside it that allows things to go through. And then somewhere in that channel, you have to have by shape, position of various amino acids, you have to have something that acts as the gatekeeper, as something that's selective. So it says, oh, this molecule can fit nicely through the channel, but this one gets blocked somehow. It won't go into the channel. It runs into a constriction or it runs into some amino acids that it doesn't like or whatever the case is. That's where you get the selectivity of these things. Now, like virtually all proteins, facilitated diffusion proteins are regulated. In other words, we do not want to have these channels open all the time. 
you don't want ions rushing in or out of the cell because sometimes you want to have more of one kind of ion and less of others. You may not always, if you are picture a yeast host, you're feeding, you're taking in amino acids and stuff from an environment rich in them, or sugars from an environment rich in them, like the culture media. If you put them in an environment that's poor and all that stuff, you don't want all your nutrients to leak out by facilitate diffusion. So we have to regulate these things. We have to close and open the channel gate whenever we want. And this, by the way, is also true of active transport. A few little differences. <coughs> They're regulated. Okay. Now, how do we regulate these kinds of things? There's several ways of doing it. And a given channel may be regulated in multiple fashions. One of them is our own standby phosphorylation. We covalently attach phosphate groups to key parts of the protein, causes a structural change that opens or closes the channel. That'll work. And many of these things are regulated by phosphorylation, either opening or closing the thing. Many facilitate diffusion proteins are regulated by the binding, the non-covalent binding of some kind of regulatory mole. Usually a small one, but sometimes it can be another protein. So sometimes one protein can bind to a channel protein, the channel opens or closes. Many times it's usually a small molecule that binds to the channel protein and regulates. So we could say regulation, and we'll say non-covalent binding, Non-covalent binding of some kind of regulatory molecule, generally a small one, but not necessarily. A good example of these are the neurotransmitter receptors. These are the proteins in the receiving end, or what we call the dendrites of nerve cells that get signals from other nerve cells. Most of these neurotransmitter receptors are ion channels. They open only when the appropriate neurotransmitter binds to them and the neurotransmitter releases and the channel closes. And that's how you get nerve transmission from one nerve cell to the next, these neurotransmitters. So that's an example. We'll look at that more later. Now these kinds of molecules, they are regulated by binding particular, particular small molecules, or sometimes not so small. When you have a molecule that binds to a protein, we often call that, we give it the generic term, the ligand, especially if you're talking about receptor proteins. It's just like we mentioned the substrate of an enzyme is whatever molecule or molecules the enzyme binds. So, a molecule that will bind to, say, a neurotransmitter receptor, a neurotransmitter in other words, we could say is the ligand of that. <coughs> so we call this type of regulation ligand-gated. <coughs> Ligand meaning some small molecule binding to the term gated meaning just like a gate that opens or closes the tunnel, you have something that opens or closes the channel. So when a molecule, the appropriate molecule, binds to the channel, the channel opens or in some cases it closes. Now a few examples we have structural information that's literally what happens when the appropriate ligand binds to the molecule to the transport protein. What will happen is a is a loop or a region of amino acids will pull out of the way that's normally covering part of the channel. It will pull away, opening the channel up, literally like opening a gate to a tunnel. Okay, so we have, that's the second way of doing it, the ligand gate. The third way of doing it, and as far as I know, I think this applies only to facilitating diffusion, but the third way of doing it is also kind of interesting. 
Some membrane proteins, facilitate diffusion transport proteins, are actually open and closed by changes in electrical difference across the membranes. Turns out cell membranes, and we'll see why later on, cell membranes actually have an electrical voltage across it. The inside of a cell is typically negative about 50 to 70 millivolts. That's about a 20th to about a 15th of a volt across the cell membrane. If you change that, that can alter the structure of a membrane protein in there, causing a channel to open or close. And that's what we call voltage gated. Voltage gated ion channels are critically important in nerve transmission, as we'll see later on. Now, you may ask a little question here. The question is this. If you're talking about electrical difference across the membrane of less than a tenth of a volt, like a 20th of a volt, that don't sound like much. After all, a typical flashlight battery has 1.5 volts. But let's do, somebody have a calculator, let's do a little calculation to see that that tiny voltage across the membrane can make a big difference. Now there's this concept, anybody's taken physics or remembers their high school physics, this concept called an electric field. An electric field is just the change in voltage over distance. Now, for instance here, right now I'm standing about, let's say two meters, it's not, I don't think uh, it's quite that, but let's say I'm standing two meters beneath this. I've got 120 volt lines running through here. So I could say 120 volts difference relative to my head over two meters, I would say we have an electrical field, electric field of 60 volts per meter. Now, that ain't much. Now, let's, have you ever, for instance, driven down a road with AM radio on, and you go underneath some high-tension wires, and all of a sudden the signal gets really distorted and stuff? That's the electric field. Those wires that may be 20 or 30 meters over your head are carrying over a quarter million volts. And that electric field is powerful enough to distort the radio waves coming in from your AM radio and then you get static and snow and you lose the music or Rush Limbaugh or whatever you're listening to. Hey, you could lose them, that's a good thing. Okay. <laughs> All right, well anyway, let's do a little calculation here about electric field. Especially if I spell it right. Okay, here we have here. We're gonna have an electrical difference of let's say 0.05 volts across a membrane. Now, how <laughs> thick is that membrane, that lipid bilayer? It's only about four nanometers. So let's put, in fact, we'll put four times 10 to the minus seven centimeters. We'll express the electric field in volts per centimeter. So I'm pull out a calculator. Let's see how much that little tiny electrical difference across the membrane really means. Okay, so we got that calculator. 6.9420 times 10 to the 9. Excuse me? 6.9420 times 10 to the 9. Uh, let's see. 0.05. No, I think it's going to be less. It's going to be less. 0.05 divided by 4 times 10 to the minus, minus 7. Volts per centimeter. Now, 
to give you an example of what that means, suppose you had your hand an inch away from an active high tension wire. That's the same electric field you would get. Now, I do not recommend it. What do you think would happen if you were grounded and put your hand a mere inch away from a high tension wire? Crispy critters, right? You are going to get <coughs> you are going to get fried, fried, fried doing that. The reason why is air can only stand about twenty thousand volts per centimeter. If you get a static shock, the voltages can often be in the thousands of volts. That's why it stinks. Fortunately, amperages are low, but your typical static shock has a higher voltage than your typical electric chair, which is the amperage is a lot lower. So when you start talking about electric field strains of that magnitude, that can, you imagine, that can bend and twist and distort any of the proteins that go through the membrane. Change that, and that can shift the amino acids around and open and close an eye channel, for instance. So that's what we see here with voltage-gated regulation of facilitated diffusion. Now when we're done, what we're going to do when we come back is we're going to look at a couple examples of that, go on to act and transport a few more examples of that, and then continue on. So I'll see you folks in the lab at least 70